In a small Kentucky town, a young boy vanished without a trace. No one knew how it could have happened. But within hours, the boy's entire family was frantically searching for him. The few leads in the case quickly turned cold. And the FBI was called in to expose the kidnapper and find the missing child. On the day before Thanksgiving, a mother discovered her 10-year-old son was missing from his school. When a child of separated parents disappears, investigators first look at the family, and divorced parents often suspect each other. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The search by the FBI and local authorities would cover a thousand miles. They were determined to find the boy and his abductor. London, Kentucky is a quiet, rural town surrounded by rolling hills in the heart of Kentucky's tobacco country. It is a traditional town where many farming families have lived for generations and most of the people know and trust each other. At 11 a.m. on the day before Thanksgiving, November 25th, 1992, the children of Paces Creek Elementary School were looking forward to a special holiday luncheon before they left for the long weekend. Keep up the good work. What are we doing over here? Oh, we've got a blue going. Oh, Scotty. Oh, we're doing a turkey in the hand. Ten-year-old Scotty Baker was especially excited. After school, he was to stay at his grandmother's house until his father picked him up on Thanksgiving morning. Scotty planned to spend the entire weekend traveling alone with his father on a long-haul trucking run. Since his parents were divorced, Scotty relished the time he spent with his father and loved to ride in the trucks his dad drove for a living. Following an afternoon tutoring session, Scotty was scheduled to go home on the bus at 3 p.m. to his grandmother's house. For Scotty's mother, Ruth, it would be the first Thanksgiving her youngest child was away from her. She and her daughter decided to surprise Scotty and pick him up before he got on the bus. The single mother only had what remained of the day to see her son before he left on the trip with his father the next morning. Ruth waited in the car while her daughter went in to fetch Scotty. I picked Scotty up at school that day instead of having him ride the bus to his grandmother's house because he was going to be gone with his father the full Thanksgiving weekend. And I just wanted to see him before he left. Do you guys know where Scotty is? Scotty's sister asked some of his classmates if they'd seen him, but they hadn't. Excuse me. Do you know where Scotty is? His teacher said that he had not shown up for his scheduled after-school tutoring, but figured he had skipped it to start his long weekend. Have a happy Thanksgiving. You too. Where's Scotty? I don't know. I looked outside for him and no one's seen him. I asked the teacher. Ruth hadn't called ahead, so she thought Scotty had probably taken the bus as previously planned. I just thought there was some sort of a misunderstanding as to, you know, whether he was supposed to stay that day. I thought he just rode the bus back to his grandmother's house and somewhere we had just missed, missed him. Scotty's grandmother lived close by, so the boy Dorothy. would certainly be there by now. I'll go upstairs and check for him. Great, thanks. Dorothy! Have you seen but Scotty's grandmother had not seen him get off the bus that day. No, I took him to school and dropped him off at school. Ruth called his friend's parents in the neighborhood. This is Scotty's mom. But none of their children had seen Scotty either. When we searched the neighborhood and realized that he didn't go home with any of the kids, we went back to school um, 
to try to find out if maybe he'd stayed there for some reason, missed the bus, or... At that point, we didn't know what to think. Scotty had never got on the bus and went home with another child or went anywhere without telling either myself or his grandmother. Ruth found the principal in the main office and asked for his help to locate her son. By this time, the teachers had all gone home for the holiday weekend. The principal told her he would try to contact Scotty's teachers at home. Then Ruth made an alarming discovery. She saw that Scotty had been signed out at 11.20 that day. The sign-out book was just laying there on the desk, and I just happened to look down and see it, and see his name on it. And it said Scotty Baker had been signed out by Patricia Smith. Ruth recognized the name. Scotty's father had a cousin named Patricia Smith that Ruth had met once years before. It was strange that the cousin would have picked up Scotty without telling anyone in the immediate family since she wasn't authorized. The principal called the school secretary to find out more. He reached her at a hospital where she was visiting a sick relative. The principal asked if she had released Scotty to a woman named Patricia Smith six hours earlier. She confirmed that she had. The secretary recalled that Patricia Smith, a dark-haired woman with glasses, walked into the office at about 11.15 a.m. The young woman said she was Scotty's cousin and was picking him up to take him to his father. When Scotty's fifth grade class passed by the front office on their way to the Thanksgiving luncheon, the secretary summoned Scotty with exciting news. His cousin had come to take him early from school. The secretary knew most of the children's parents and relatives, but she had never met Patricia Smith before. She added that Scotty didn't seem afraid of the woman, and he left willingly. The principal conveyed the news to Ruth. She was upset to learn that Scotty had been released to another person without her permission. She was taking him to see his father. So that kind of made sense to me. Because if Donnie was out on the road and he was just going to swing in, um, he might have had somebody pick him up. But it was strange to me why it would be somebody that Scotty didn't know. Apparently knew each other and Scotty was Ruth didn't know Patricia Smith either, did nor did she know her number. She demanded that the principal call the authorities. Kentucky State Police sent two troopers to the school to help track down the missing juvenile. The principal handed officers a school photograph of Scotty Baker and provided them with the names and addresses of his fifth grade classmates. You didn't give her permission in any way, shape, or form. Ruth told officers that her son was last seen six hours earlier, leaving school with a woman named Patricia Smith. Though her ex-husband, Donnie, had a relative by that name, Ruth could not provide them with her address or phone number. Investigators' first task was to locate the cousin. Former Kentucky State Police Detective Larry Lewis discovered that Donnie Baker's cousin, Patty Smith, lived very close to the school, as Ruth had remembered. We went to uh, Patty Smith's, uh, that was related to Donnie, a cousin, and talked to her, and she didn't fit the description whatsoever. And uh, her alibi checked out where she was at. Into the evening, police pursued all the women named Patricia Smith within a 100-mile radius of Scotty's school. They found several. All were home since the next day was Thanksgiving. But none looked like the woman described by the school secretary, and all had solid alibis. People vouch for this. There was about three or four other uh, Patricia Smiths that we checked out, and uh, none of them panned out. So we eventually found out that uh, 
It wasn't a Patricia Smith that somebody would used that for an alias. At Scotty's grandmother's house, Ruth and her two daughters braced themselves for the worst. Almost eight hours after Scotty was taken from school by an unidentified woman, there was still no word. Ruth tried to reach her ex-husband, Donnie, to see if he might know something. She left a message with his manager at the trucking company, who told her that Donnie was somewhere on the highway delivering a load of freight to Ottawa, Illinois. We waited for him to call because, for some reason, I thought he'd know where he was when he got there. That was the only hope that we had at that point, that somehow Donnie would know who had him when he found out that he was, that he was gone. Kentucky State Police continued to search for answers locally. They traveled to the homes of the children that had attended school with the missing boy that day. One of Scotty's friends had spent most of that day with him. He recalled seeing Scotty leave with the young woman. Did Scotty seem afraid of her? The 10 year old also saw the car they got into. He knew it had four doors, but he was unsure of the model. The boy remembered clearly that Scotty was happy about leaving and showed no fear of her. Do you know her hair color? He said that all Scotty had talked about that day was traveling on the road alone with his father. The fifth grader had little else to add. Please give us a call. If you think of anything else, let her know. By 10 p.m., more than 10 hours after Scotty was last seen, investigators still had no solid leads to his whereabouts. Since they'd received no ransom calls, police now turned their attention to Scotty's family and friends. Hello? Scotty's stepmother, Stephanie Baker, stayed by the phone. Perhaps someone who was close to the boy knew more than they were telling. In child abduction cases, it is usually one of the parents who is responsible since they have greatest access to the child. Scotty's mother, Ruth, understood this and was willing to provide investigators with whatever they needed to find her son. Of course, any law enforcement official, I think that's their first thought, that the mother and father have something to do with it when a child disappears. I think that's the first people they investigate. And in this case, they immediately thought Donnie or I had something to do with it simply because we were divorced. Detectives asked about her relationship with her ex-husband, Donnie. Every time he would go over there, he would always come home complain. She said that she and Donnie were distant, but for Scotty's sake, they remained generally respectful of each other. The couple had divorced five years prior. According to Ruth, the divorce was acrimonious, with custody of their son acting as the main point of contention. After some wrangling, Ruth and Donnie agreed to joint custody. To her knowledge, when her ex-husband and Scotty on the weekends, he always treated their son well. In fact, Ruth believed if there was anyone who might harm her boy, it was Stephanie, her ex-husband's new wife of nine months. Ruth claimed that Stephanie was jealous of Scotty's closeness with his father. I didn't know Stephanie very well. What I knew about her really was from Scotty, and at this point, Scotty wasn't telling me a whole lot about her. I knew that he didn't want to go to their house anymore, and I knew that he didn't want to be around Stephanie much, but I, I thought it was just the feelings that he was picking up, the feelings of jealousy that he was picking up from her. Investigators thought that Ruth might also be jealous of Donnie's new wife as well for the time that Stephanie and Scotty's father had been spending with the 10-year-old. With mixed motives and emotions, Detective Lewis believed at least one of Scotty's guardians was likely responsible for the boy's disappearance. There were several suspects from the beginning. Stephanie Baker, because she was the stepmother. Uh, Donnie Baker, because he was the father. And Ruth Baker, because she was the mother. 
uh, there was a conflict between uh, Ruth and Stephanie, so those three were the main suspects. By midnight, November 26th, Scotty had been missing for over 12 hours. Scotty's father, Donnie Baker, was returning from Illinois where he had learned of his son's disappearance. He had dropped off his rig and hitched a ride back to London, Kentucky with a friend. Donnie's wife, Stephanie, and her father were waiting at a truck stop to pick him up. They didn't have the good news Donnie had hoped for. Everyone was tired, but Donnie insisted on heading out to search for Scott. He and Stephanie drove to some nearby woods where Donnie and Scotty had often hunted and Donnie, shot at targets together. But they found no sign of his missing son. Scotty! With dawn approaching, Stephanie pleaded with Donnie to give up for the night and head home. He finally relented. Early on Thanksgiving morning, Donnie and his ex-wife Ruth set out to distribute flyers with Scotty's photo. With their 10-year-old son now missing for almost 24 hours, tension got the better of them. They accused each other of taking Scotty and hiding him. Despite their mutual suspicions, Donnie and Ruth continued canvassing the area. Thank you. Thank you. They posted flyers in every business that was open on Thanksgiving. On a day meant for family, they received no reports of sightings of their missing son. They could only hope that Scotty was still alive. On Thanksgiving Day, 1992, Kentucky State Police still had no leads to the whereabouts of 10-year-old Scotty Baker. The boy had been taken from school the day before by a young woman who claimed to be his father's cousin. Scotty's father, Donnie, a truck driver who had recently remarried, was on the road when his son disappeared. Police arrived at his home to interview him and his new wife of nine months, Stephanie Baker. Investigators suspected that perhaps someone close to the missing boy knew more than they were saying. The officer told the couple that he needed to interview them separately. He didn't want either of them to influence the other's responses. Donnie Baker appeared anxious, but assured the officer he'd cooperate in any way that he could. He confirmed that he planned to pick up Scotty on Thanksgiving morning after delivering a truckload of cargo to Illinois the previous evening. He and his son were going to be traveling alone to Tennessee and back. Donnie added that he didn't ask his cousin Patricia Smith or anyone else to pick up Scotty from school the day before. Stephanie told the trooper that the morning that Scotty was taken, she was at home doing laundry with her friend Suzanne. Stephanie suspected that Donnie's first wife, Ruth, was probably hiding Scotty somewhere. She believed that Ruth was jealous of her marriage to Donnie and that her husband's ex-wife would try something drastic to win him back. Detectives also interviewed the secretary from Scotty's school, the only witness who had stood face to face with Scotty's unknown abductor. She was shown photographs of all the women in the family, including Scotty's mother, Ruth, and his stepmother, Stephanie. Even if they had worn a disguise, the secretary was sure that none of them could be the young woman with the dark hair and glasses who had taken Scotty from school the previous morning. After more than 24 hours of searching, the safe recovery of the 10-year-old was becoming less likely. Former Kentucky State Police Detective Larry Lewis decided to use polygraph examinations to help eliminate the immediate family members. Polygraphs are 
to me, they are just an aid. Uh, uh, I don't trust the polygraph 100%, but it can help you. Is your first name Ruth? Scotty's mother, Ruth, was tested first. Do you know for sure where Scotty is right now? No, sir. She also provided a handwriting sample to compare to the signature of the woman who signed Scotty out of school. In the year 2000, Her handwriting remember. did not match the suspects. So and the results of Ruth's polygraph exam showed no signs of deception. I was cleared first as a suspect. I took a lie detector test and had no problem. I, the detective you know, told me it. I passed it with flying colors, so they immediately cleared me. Ruth's ex-husband, Donnie, was also called in for testing. Though police confirmed he was out of state at the time of Scotty's disappearance, they could not rule out his possible involvement. The results of Donnie's exam were inconclusive and revealed possible deception. They hoped his young wife, Stephanie, could provide answers, but they hit an obstacle, as Detective Larry Lewis explains. Stephanie was asked to take a polygraph, but she was pregnant at the time, is what she told me. And the state police will not give uh, anybody that's pregnant a polygraph. Uh, that's their policy. Uh, so when she told me that, I didn't know if she was lying to me or not, so I sent her to the hospital, and I had her uh, tested and it was determined that she was pregnant. Stephanie did provide a handwriting sample. But like Ruth's, it appeared not to match the signature of the woman who signed out Scotty. I woke up. It's around eight. Stephanie also gave a detailed account of her activities on the previous day. She maintained that she spent the morning at home doing laundry with her friend Suzanne. Took them several hours, and they passed some of the time on the phone with another friend. By the early afternoon, they had finished their wash and planned to head back to Suzanne's house. <laughs> yeah. That's when Suzanne realized she had lost her keys and feared she had locked them in the trunk. The in the car. Are you kidding me? Yeah. So we decided to call. Stephanie called several locksmiths, but found none that were immediately available. So Suzanne called her mother, who came to pick her up. Stephanie gave investigators Suzanne's address so they could corroborate the story. Late on Thanksgiving night, investigators found Stephanie's friend Suzanne at home at her apartment. She was relaxing with her husband, a trucker who was home for the holiday weekend. The detective asked her where she was on the morning that Scotty Baker disappeared. Suzanne confirmed that she did laundry all morning at Stephanie's house. Suzanne also said that at about 11 a.m., Stephanie spoke to a mutual friend about making plans for all of them to get Hello? together sometime over the long hey. weekend. But after they found out Scotty was missing, no one was in the mood to go out. Mm -hmm. we don't know. Suzanne told pretty much the same story as Stephanie, that, that she was over at Stephanie's house and that they was washing clothes and that they received a phone call. Uh, and that she locked her keys up in the car and that her mother had come over and picked her up. We left, went out Suzanne provided police with a friend's number, who later confirmed the call. The detective asked her to call them if she remembered anything else. As snow dusted London, Kentucky on Thanksgiving night, Scotty was still nowhere to be found. I think we had the first snow that week, and I remember standing in the window at the edge of dark thinking that my baby is out there somewhere, and it's snowing, and he's probably cold, because that whoever's got him is probably not giving him anything to put on. He doesn't have any clean clothes, and he's not took a bath, and I don't even know if they're giving him anything to eat. And that was, I think, the saddest snowfall that I ever saw in my entire life. On Friday, November 27, 1992, Kentucky State Police called on the FBI for help. Special Agent Rod Kincaid from the FBI's London, Kentucky office learned that it had been two days since Scotty had been missing. Our immediate concern was for his safety 
and to see that the boy would be returned home with his family. The longer an investigation goes on, the longer uh, the child is missing, there's more chance for the child to meet with foul play. And if it is a kidnapping, there's more danger that the child will be harmed. By now, Scotty could be anywhere. And investigators hoped there was still enough time to rescue the fifth grader from his unknown abductor. On November 27th, 1992, the day after Thanksgiving, the small town of London, Kentucky was still reeling from the disappearance of 10-year-old Scotty Baker, who had now been missing for two days. Since the fifth grader was last seen with a woman who claimed to be a relative, FBI Special Agent Rod Kincaid, along with local detectives, looked to Scotty's family for answers. Our investigation basically was looking at the close family members who might have access uh, to Scotty, who Scotty would go with willingly, because he had, it had been reported that he left the school um, in, a, in a rather pleasant way. He did not appear to be frightened of the person who took him from the school. Mrs. Baker, uh, Investigators again met with Scotty's single mother, Ruth. She had hardly slept since Scotty went missing and confirmed that she had not yet received any ransom demands. Ruth maintained that she believed her ex-husband, Donnie, and his 21-year-old wife, Stephanie, probably knew more than they were saying. She didn't trust his new young wife. Ruth claimed that she and Stephanie had never spent time together socially and only ran into each other in the small town stores. Even then, Ruth didn't speak to her since Stephanie always acted jealous and immature, seemingly mocking Ruth from a distance with her friend Suzanne. Ruth recalled that Stephanie had also harassed her children. Just a week before Scotty went missing, Stephanie had followed Ruth's daughter and Scotty as they were heading home. Scotty felt that Stephanie despised him for visiting her new husband, Donnie, so often. Stephanie appeared threatened by the boy's close relationship with his father. Ruth said that Scotty didn't like seeing his father if Stephanie was going to be there. Ruth was a very concerned mother. I received a very good impression uh, from Ruth Baker. I, I certainly did not suspect Ruth of being involved with the disappearance of Scotty. <laughs> acting just like a concerned mother should act. How are you? Good. Good. At the FBI office in London, Kentucky, agents asked Scotty's father, Donnie, to come in for a second polygraph <laughs> killed the first time. He passed this one, showing no signs of deception. Donnie now confided that, like Ruth, he too had become suspicious of his new wife, Stephanie, according to former detective Larry Lewis. Donnie is a is a very laid-back person. Uh, he, he doesn't get upset really easy. Uh, he was very helpful, though, after uh, we finally uh, got him talking. He started saying Stephanie did have some problems uh, with his son, Scotty. The relationship between yeah, Stephanie, yeah, Donnie, and Scotty had become strained. Just before Donnie left on his most recent trip, Stephanie became angry when he wasn't thrilled by the news that she was pregnant. And then when you come home on the weekend, she was convinced that it was because Donnie was so close with Scotty. Stephanie complained that Donnie spent more time with his son than with her. Since Donnie was on the road so much, his time at home was limited, and to Stephanie, it seemed that Scotty always had priority. Donnie found Stephanie's diary and gave it to investigators as evidence. They found several passages that were disturbing. I recall seeing in the diary words like, Donnie loves Scotty more than me. I hate Donnie, or I hate Scotty. And there were words like, I wish Scotty was gone. I wish something would happen to him. There were a 
lot of indications in that diary that she resented Scotty and that she hated Scotty. Agents called Stephanie in to take a polygraph exam. Unlike the state of Kentucky, FBI policy does not exempt pregnant women from the test. Now, Stephanie, did you ever... When the examiner asked if she knew what happened to Scotty, her response indicated deception. Following the exam, Stephanie was held for further questioning. Armed with the information from her diary and her failed polygraph exam, investigators pressed Stephanie on the details of her alibi, which she held firm. She repeated her claim that on November 25th, the day Scotty disappeared from school, she was at home with her friend Suzanne doing laundry the entire day. Stephanie also mentioned the phone conversation she had with a second friend starting at 11 a.m., corroborating Suzanne's version of events. Hey, what's up? The timing of the phone call was critical, since Scotty was taken at 11.20 a.m. But agents could not confirm the call with phone records since it was a holiday weekend and phone company personnel would not be back in the office until Monday morning. Bye. To agents, Stephanie's demeanor struck them as odd since she appeared unfazed that her stepson had now been missing for two and a half days. One thing that I recall is how cold Stephanie was when she discussed uh, her stepson, Scotty Baker. I recall that she was certainly not the least bit or did not appear to be concerned uh, with the disappearance of Scotty. Even though she used the words that she was concerned, uh, her demeanor, her expressions conveyed to me that she really wasn't that concerned. Stephanie provided a second handwriting sample for the FBI to compare to the one left at the school by Scotty's abductor. Investigators confirmed that the signatures did not match. Though they felt certain that Stephanie was lying about her knowledge of Scotty's whereabouts, she was definitely not the woman who had removed Scotty from school. Stephanie's alibi hinged on the statements of her friend Suzanne. On Monday, November 30th, investigators returned to the friend's apartment to re-question her and ask her to come in for a polygraph. But Suzanne was not at home. By November 30th, 1992, five days had passed since 10-year-old Scotty Baker was taken from his school near London, Kentucky by an unknown woman. It's never just us. Scotty is the FBI and Kentucky state detectives believed Scotty's stepmother, Stephanie, was somehow involved since she was found to be deceptive on her polygraph exam. Stephanie claimed to be doing laundry with her friend Suzanne on the day Scotty went missing. Though Suzanne corroborated Stephanie's story, former Kentucky State Detective Larry Lewis doubted Suzanne's credibility. Suzanne and Stephanie uh, seemed like to me that they had their stories down to Pat and they were telling the same story. They were telling the same times. Uh, it, it put a lot of question in my mind that how they could have their stories down and they were so alike even on their times. Uh, so uh, we were narrowing our investigation down to Suzanne and Stephanie. Agents wanted to confirm the story by polygraphing Suzanne, but Suzanne was nowhere to be found. Investigators called on her mother to ask if she knew where Suzanne might be. She said her daughter had left for Florida with her husband, a truck driver who was scheduled to make a delivery. The mother didn't know when they would be back. An FBI agent went to the Kentucky trucking firm where Suzanne's husband was employed. The foreman confirmed that the trucker was on the road, scheduled to arrive in Pompano Beach, Florida, the following morning, December 1st, 1992. 
He did not know which routes the driver had taken and could not confirm if the trucker's wife, Suzanne, or the missing 10-year-old boy was with him. No, I didn't see him leave with anybody. With the truck out of CB range of the company, investigators had no way to reach the trucker on the road. Kentucky investigators turned to FBI Special Agent Roger Ramirez in the Miami field office for help. Our goal is to be able to quickly resolve the situation with the discovery of the child alive. When this information came to us, we were hopeful that it was going to be the case and hopefully that the, this uh, little boy, Scotty, would be in the custody of, these, uh, of this couple. He's coming. Since the truck's specific route was unknown, it would be next to impossible for agents or police to locate the rig as evening approached. You don't want to put the kid in danger. He's got pressure. Twelve hours remained until its scheduled arrival in South Florida. He could take 75, he could take 90. Agents planned to be there when the semi pulled in. Until then, they held out hope that somewhere out on the highway, there was a truck with Scotty Baker on board speeding toward Florida. The only information we had received was that they were en route from London, Kentucky to Pompano Beach. The Miami division was not advised of any other stops the a vehicle might be making. However, with a sealed load, we assumed it would be coming directly to the Pompano Beach uh, warehouse. At 7 a.m. on December 1st, 1992, FBI agents arrived at the warehouse as planned a half hour before the 18-wheeler's scheduled arrival. But it appeared the truck they were looking for had already arrived. A license plate check confirmed it. Though the door was open, they saw no sign of the driver, his wife Suzanne, or the missing 10-year-old boy. Then Suzanne's husband stepped out from behind the truck and asked what they were doing around his rig. We advised him that we wanted to speak to his wife. He indicated to us that she was sleeping in the cab. We also requested permission to search the vehicle for the young boy. He granted both willingly. The child was not there. But Suzanne was. She climbed out, still groggy from sleeping. Suzanne said she didn't understand why they wanted to talk to her. She had already been interviewed about the case back in Kentucky. Agreeing to cooperate, Suzanne assured them she'd answer any questions they may still have. Agents told her husband that they also needed to search inside the trailer. The trucker was unwilling to break the seal on the trailer door. If it were broken, his client could refuse the goods. Agents photographed the seal to protect the delivery requirements. Satisfied, the trucker raised the door. In the sparsely loaded semi, an agent searched for any trace of the missing boy while Detective Lewis waited in Kentucky for word. In my heart, I knew after about 24 hours that more than likely uh, foul play had been committed. But I was still hoping at that time that he would be in the truck, but it proved out that he wasn't. The Florida agent asked Suzanne to tell him everything she knew about her friend Stephanie's 10-year-old stepson, Scotty. Suzanne said she knew nothing and claimed that she had never even met the boy. She agreed to return to the office so they could fingerprint and photograph her. Her husband needed to stay at the warehouse with his truck. Agents in Florida received further instructions from Agent Rod Kincaid in Kentucky. I asked them to conduct a polygraphic examination of Suzanne to test her veracity concerning her recollection of the events and to obtain handwriting exemplars from uh, Suzanne and have her write wording similar to that uh, used in the sign-out log. 
especially the words Patricia Smith. At the field office in Miami, Suzanne was photographed, fingerprinted, and polygraphed as requested. Suzanne was found to be deceptive on her alibi during Scotty Baker's disappearance. Anyone to cause Scotty's disappearance. And though she had denied it, the test also revealed that she likely knew where he was now. As Suzanne provided agents with a writing sample, they informed her that the results of her polygraph suggested deception. So, but she remained steadfast in her denial. Like her friend Stephanie, Suzanne could not be arrested on the basis of a failed polygraph. And unless her signature matched the suspects, agents would be forced to release her. On December 1st, 1992, six days after 10-year-old Scotty Baker was taken from his school in London, Kentucky, FBI agents had searched a truck in South Florida where they believed the boy may have been hidden. Scotty was not there, but his stepmother's friend, Suzanne, was. Though she and Stephanie were close, Suzanne claimed she had never met Scotty, according to FBI Special Agent Roger Ramirez. Suzanne have denied any knowledge and or involvement in the disappearance of Scott Baker. Um, she uh, indicated she'd never even seen the child in person and only seen him in photographs. Suzanne accompanied agents to the Miami FBI field office, where she provided a writing sample to compare to the one left by Scotty's abductor. She had also consented to take a polygraph exam, and it had revealed possible deception. In spite of the results, the 22-year-old continued to insist that she and her friend Stephanie Baker had no involvement in the abduction of Stephanie's stepson, Scotty. At the Miami field office, she gave basically a similar count, initially denying any involvement in her knowledge. However, we as investigators felt that there was something missing and there was something that she was not telling us. Help to find that young boy. After an hour of questioning, to know Suzanne is. finally broke. She may have realized that it was only a matter of time until the FBI positively matched her signature to the woman's that had removed Scotty from school six days earlier. Suzanne admitted that she had portrayed herself as Patricia Smith, acting as if she was the boy's distant relative. She claimed that Scotty's pregnant stepmother, Stephanie, had convinced her to sign him out. And Suzanne said Stephanie wanted to get back at her husband. Suzanne informed us they took Scotty out of school to scare him. Stephanie was jealous of the relationship that the child had with its father, Donnie Baker. Stephanie was pregnant with Donnie's child at the time, and she was jealous of the relationship. I need, I need to talk to you. Stephanie Baker's plan was to scare him, to keep him from going to visit his father. Stephanie arrived at Suzanne's apartment the day before Thanksgiving, November 25th at 9.30 a.m. She had had a fight with her husband, Donnie, and wanted Suzanne's help to get even. At first, Suzanne was reluctant to get involved, but Stephanie was insistent, pleading with her to help as a friend. I don't know, just please help me. You're my best friend, please. Suzanne eventually agreed. Suzanne donned a disguise which would have facilitated her removing the child. Stephanie also provided her the name of this relative to sign on the dismissal form. Scotty had never met his father's cousin, Patricia Smith, nor Suzanne. Stephanie figured the boy would go willingly when the disguised woman told Scotty she was taking him to see his father. Suzanne confirmed that they spent the rest of the morning at Stephanie's until Suzanne drove her to Scotty's school at about 11 a.m. Stephanie hid in the back seat as Suzanne retrieved Scotty from the school's secretary. Suzanne claimed that at the time, she didn't realize the child would never see his school or his parents again. Suzanne said she headed north out of London, Kentucky. 
Scotty told her how excited he was to go on the road trip with his father for the entire weekend. Once a child was inside of the vehicle with them, uh, Stephanie, who was seated in the back, reaches, starts choking the child in the front seat, and then pulls him into the back seat. Suzanne begged her to stop. However, as she put it, Stephanie freaked out. Scotty fought for his life, kicking and screaming. But his 21-year-old stepmother was too strong. In moments, the boy was dead. Suzanne simply continued to drive. She didn't know what to do. Stephanie, at this point, says that she would blame her because Suzanne was the one who checked the child out of school. As a result, Suzanne basically felt she had no choice other than to agree to help dispose of the body. The women drove to an abandoned strip mine nearby. They searched for a spot to hide the body away from the road. Where are we going? Up here. Suzanne said a few hours later, they returned with gasoline to burn the corpse before burying it. Investigators needed to know where the body could be found. Agents asked Suzanne for specific directions. So I provided her a pen and piece of paper for her to draw the exact location as to where the body had been placed. Suzanne then drew a very detailed map as to where the body of Donald Scott Baker could be located in the London, Kentucky area. On the afternoon of December 1st, 1992, six days after 10-year-old Scotty Baker was abducted on Thanksgiving Eve, authorities retrieved the boy's charred remains. His stepmother, Stephanie Baker, after repeated denials, eventually confessed to the murder and was arrested. Residents were shocked that a pregnant woman could have done this to a child. Investigators working the case, including Special Agent Rod Kincaid, were deeply affected by the harsh reality of Scotty's murder. This is one of the cases I had as an FBI agent that certainly I'll never forget. It was horrible that a 10-year-old boy would be taken from a school and murdered. FBI agents have families. I, I have two sons. It was a horrible case. I feel very badly for the parents because I know they cared about their son. Stephanie's accomplice and friend, Suzanne, was prosecuted first. Because of intense media coverage, her trial was moved to another county. Commonwealth attorney for the 27th Judicial Circuit in Kentucky, Tom Handy, convinced the jury that Suzanne was guilty of reckless homicide, kidnapping, and abusing a corpse. How she could drive a vehicle with this child being strangled immediately next to her, touching her, is unbelievable to me. She drove that vehicle for five minutes while little Scotty was being strangled to death. A terrible time. Her vehicle has dents and marks on the dashboard caused by this child kicking it during his death. Suzanne received a sentence of 25 years for her crimes. Facing the death penalty, 21-year-old Stephanie Baker pled guilty to murder and received a life sentence. Seven months after entering prison, Stephanie gave birth to a baby boy. Her parents are raising the child, and her husband, Donnie, divorced her. Ten years after the tragedy, Scotty's mother, Ruth Baker, has managed to press forward in the face of her devastating loss. It's hard to say what your life would have been like, you know, if he had lived. Um, I think that it's made me a better parent to my other two children and my grandchildren, because I'm very protective of them. Ruth Baker visits Scotty's gravesite often. As a result of her son's case, state legislation was passed in Kentucky requiring photo identification for any person signing a child out of school. 
The Bakers hope that through the loss of Scotty, other families may avoid the pain they've suffered.